In this talk, I will discuss actual ring down modes of a black hole, which is the consequence of the merge of two black holes. These modes were, will be compared between general relativity and pseudo complex extension. My collaborators, Enrique Lopez Moreno, Faculty of Sciences. I will only concentrate on the Schwarzschild case, non rotating black holes. The main ingredient is the zero zero component of the matrix, which is shown here which has a constant mass for the GR case. And in general, this mass will depend on R, especially for the PCGR case. I will use this mass function, where chi for zero is GR and for one it is PCGR. This mass function is a consequence of assuming vacuum fluctuations around the black hole. These vacuum fluctuations were calculated by Matt Visser in uh, using semi-classical quantum mechanics in a curved space time background. The density he obtained for the vacuum fluctuation energy is uh, one over R to six times some complicated function. We use here a phenomenological approach uh, and use one over R to N plus two. For N is three, we did several calculations in the past, but it was shown in this publication by Nielsen Birnholz who were using the results of the first observed gravitational wave event in 2016, that n has to be at last four. So here I will present results for n equal to four. Here are two other publications. The original one where we proposed the pseudo complex general relativity. And this is a book which explains it in more detail. The problem is considering the stability, investigating the stability of the Schwarzschild solution, as was done in the book by Chandrasekhar, The Mathematical Theory of Black Holes. We use his path completely. So he starts with a length square element, it's given here, and the external modes are given when omega, qr, q, theta is different from zero. We only will discuss external modes and not the polar modes. So he proceeds in a certain path, and at the end, one has to plug in what the metric is. And at that point, we plug in our metric. And uh, then we construct the differential equation. The differential equation for axial modes <coughs> is the Ritchie-Wheeler equation. It's shown here. It is a, it's a function of the second derivative of the um, Otto's coordinate. And the frequency appears, which we're interested in, and Z is the solution. V minus is a potential. It is written here. It is of the same form as in the book of Chandrasekhar, save that he has no derivative of the mass with respect to the distance. So this disappears, and M is M0. In order to uh, build up a differential equation which one can resolve numerically, one has to know the asymptotic limit. And for that, we introduce dimensionless coordinates, y, and for the Tortoise coordinate, y star. These two coordinates are related by this integral, and one knows the analytic solution for general relativity, which is given here. It's well known. In PCGR, we also found an analytic solution. For our surprise, we found it quite recently. And it is given here below in the two last rows. Um, I have written it in an equivalent form as for GR. For example, here, the two refers to the position of the event horizon, the Schwarzschild radius, and three half is the position of the event horizon in uh, the PCGR. So it, they look very similar, except for the term in the second row here, which turns out to be very important to obtain a very good asymptotic limit. Entonces, the wave function in the asymptotic limit is given here for r towards infinity. It's e to plus i omega r star, the dot twice coordinate, for example. And the time dependence is given here. And it is written in terms of its real component and imaginary component. Here you see 
in order to have stable solutions, omega i has to be negative. Otherwise, there will be no damping. We introduce the dimensionless coordinate omega tilde, multiplying it by the mass scale, and we also apply a change of coordinates from y to xi, where xi has a compact support. Why we do this will be clear in a moment when we discuss how to resolve it numerically. In the limit of our start towards infinity, xi towards one, we get this asymptotic behavior, and for our star towards minus infinity, psi dot zero, we get this asymptotic behavior. We multiply them and extract the asymptotic behavior from the function and define a new function p of psi. This is a usual way to solve a differential equation. Now we plug this in into the Rachel Wheeler equation, and we get a differential equation of second order of this type, where this x here is in reality our psi in the form of transparency. Now, the so-called asymptotic iteration method is applied, which was proposed in the first decade of this century, and uh, Cho et al. improved it. There you can find all the necessary references. The main idea is to apply successive derivations, which leads to new equations and new functions, lambda and Sn, and when the ratio of these functions don't change anymore, we have converged to a solution. It can be plugged into a quantization condition, some expression equal to zero, which is a function of x at the frequencies. And it's still a function of x or psi in our case. It is uh, not of advantage. It uh, creates difficulties. So to et al, applied a uh, Taylor expansion around this point x, any point x, and uh, they received or obtained a new quantization condition, which is only a function of omega. So you have your polynomial omega, and look for the zeros of the polynomial. This is quite straightforward. However, some remarks have to be made on a quick convergence, because it's not like that, that you can put in any x and then uh, calculate the omegas. We have to choose a compact support, then the tail expansion is more effective. This we have done before in the former transparency. You have to get the asymptotic rights. These are discussed in the last transparency, one of the last transparencies. And then uh, we have to expand around the maximum or minimum of the potential. It de depends a little bit on the, uh, on the position. You have to wiggle around a little bit. Convergence is obtained when the omegas, the frequency, don't change anymore. As a numerical routine, we use Mathematica, and it has also its problems. For example, you have to use rational numbers, and if you have irrational numbers, or real numbers in general, you have to approximate them by rational ones. Otherwise, Mathematica quickly develops instabilities numerical instabilities there are still problems remain which we don't discuss here and it is met for the future here is a result of uh, a calculation with a low number of iterations red is 20 blue is 40 it already converges for low frequencies here the horizontal axis is the minus imaginary part so it's has to be positive in order to be stable. There are no negative solutions, so it's fine. The system is not unstable, so it's stable. And the vertical axis is a frequency which has to be symmetric around this vertical axis. Left is GR, right is PCGR. Interesting to note is that at the zero axis, you have a lot of solutions. They correspond to solutions which don't emit gravitational waves, they don't oscillate, and they only show a damping. So it's like a black hole, which is just damp. <clears throat> then you see, comparing these two calculations, that they behave very similar. Here, the convergence is not so very good, as you can see in the difference of the red and blue dots. But at low frequencies, uh, low damping frequencies, you see that the GR solutions are a little bit lower than the PCR solutions. 
And that might be important if the differences are larger, especially. And it is illustrated next transparency. Where we started from the frequency of the uh, observation and we convert it into one over kilometer and we introduce dimensionless coordinates as we have done before. Now omega is fixed. So when uh, we have a certain omega tilde, like 60 solar masses, the approximate uh, mass of the black hole in the first observation of gravitational waves in 2016. <coughs> and uh, you plug in the number and you get omega tilde 0.47. Now the source, the position of the source is derived uh, assuming general relativity. So using general relativity, you can deduce how large the source is and how big the source is. So it's theory based. And if you use PCGR and omega tilde turns out to be larger, it means that the mass is larger. But when the mass is larger, it is shifted to larger distances, such that you observe the same gravitational waves at the Earth. So the results are theory based. That's the main point I wanted to say. Here's a table, the numerical table, GRPC, GR, of the low damping modes, of some low damping modes, and you see the differences are not very large, so they are very similar. Here now is a, uh, an example of large iterations, 198 and 200 is blue. And you see convergence not yet uh, obtained for large damping. <coughs> but here the convergence is quite nice. And the two results look at this range uh, similar, or look like a fish with a big head and a small tail at the left hand side. But the difference between GR, PC, GR are exhibited for larger dampings. This point is really moving further and further to the right when we increase iteration. So we have to see when this converges. And in PC, GR, you have a region which is larger, in, uh, it has larger frequencies, and larger frequencies means larger masses. Larger masses means larger distances. So when uh, we observe frequency in this range, the mass has to be larger and the object has to be at a point larger in distances. What it will be at the end, if we observe it here or here, depends very much on the dynamics of the merger of two black holes. This we cannot calculate. In a merge of two black holes, you get a frequency, a distribution of frequencies. And when the distribution lies smaller as here, we get larger masses and thus larger distances of the source. Here I present now some sample calculations from an older calculation where we use n equal to three, where the mass function is here. Also here we get an analytical solution. However, the Tortoise coordinate is imaginary, so we cannot use it. Case A corresponds to the one presented two years ago in Ivara. And what we did here, we used the asymptotic behavior of the general relativity and everywhere where a two appears, the position of the event horizon, we put a four over three. Now we have seen that for n equal to four, the two first factors don't change the exponents, so we put it back to two, but here it is still four over three because there the event horizon appears explicitly. <clears throat> and another one where we added an equivalent term to the n equal to four case, which appeared in the second drawing of formal transparency, and uh, we changed it such that it corresponds to the event horizon of four over three, so it's this exponential term. So we have three cases which we will discuss. All these asymptotic behaviors here are a guess. It's not derived. So here we have the calculations, which I presented two years ago, about 200 iterations. There are two successive iterations. And you see it has not converged yet. And we see two branches, one 
high frequency low damping part and another one which is low frequency large damping part. <laughs> when we take case B, we see that uh, it has the same form as here but with a lower slope, nearly converging. However, it's for lower iteration numbers, but it doesn't matter here. I only want to show uh, what the characteristics are. The slope is lower than here. <clears throat> and furthermore, when we consider case C, the slope gets lower and the fishtail develops. So it goes more to the solution of any cubed four case so of course it's different. So n equal to three behaves differently as n equal to four. Now we come to the conclusions. I discussed axial modes in GR and PCGR and uh, the, we used n equal to four. We also did n equal to three calculations to illustrate the difference between n equal to four and n equal to three. We obtained an analytic expression for the Tortoise coordinate, which turns out to be very important to get a good convergence and to get a better asymptotic limit. The structure of GR and PCGR are very similar, at least for low damping modes. For high damping modes, there is an essential difference, and it hints to the possibility that when the main distribution of the ring down is around high damping modes, then the mass of these black holes is significantly larger than the tubes in GR, which implies larger distances. How to measure it, observe it? In this case, one has to try to see a light event simultaneously to the gravitational wave event, of course, it requires uh, a good resolution in space. And when there are cases where the two differ, then it is in favor of PCGR. Of course, it can be a, a coincidence. So one has to observe several events which are accompanied by a light event. And when systematically, the light event hints to a larger distance than the gravitational wave events where GR is used to deduce the position of the source, then it's in favor of PCGR. Okay, all the others I have already discussed and I thank you for uh, your attention. Bye.